Hello everybody, I'm very happy to host the Michelle Center here with us and Michelle is a PhD student in the Computer Science Department of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem here. Uh, <laughs> uh, his main research area are adaptive data analysis and the differential of privacy and today he will talk to us about generalization in the face of adaptivity based on perspective. So Michelle. Thank you. So Let's start with a disclaimer. The, the word Bayesian here, as I was warned, might tick off some people and excite others. <laughs> I'm not guaranteeing this is exactly the term you are thinking of when you... So one second, I need to turn this on. Do you hear me? One, two, one, two. Okay. Good. So this is a joint work with uh, Professor Katrina Liget, my uh, advisor. And I will be spending, I think, the majority of the talk on convincing you that this framing that is similar but not identical to what you probably saw in the context of machine learning is a useful perspective, and then we'll discuss what we can say about it. So I will start with a, sort of a formal definition, and as we go along, I'll try to convince you why it really fits things you're familiar with. So let's, ima let's imagine we have a mechanism. Uh, a mechanism is a tool. Uh, black box from your perspective, which receives a sample set from the domain. X is a domain of some things we want to research, and there is a sample set of size n that uh, it gets. There is a query. A query is a, some function we want to evaluate over this sample set, and it produces a response, which is some answer to that question. So imagine uh, the sample set are a bunch of uh, patients, and the query is, um, what's the percentage of patients that have this condition and the response is some uh, number between 0 to 1 or something like that. Um, <clears throat> now imagine this is an iterative process. So there's an analyst, the issues don't come out of nowhere. The, there's an analyst issuing the query. So an analyst think about him as the, uh, her, the, the, the researcher. So she comes up with the query. Um, she's a doctor. She's trying to find a medicine. So like, what is the percentage of uh, patients with cancer among, I don't know, uh, people that smoke? And gets a number. And then she says, okay, what is the percentage among uh, 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 people that smoke and uh, are male? And she gets another number, and so on. So we can wrap it all as, think about it as one big uh, process where there's a mechanism that receives, in a way, the analyst as an input and the sample set. And the output is what we call the view, a transcript of queries and responses. Okay. Uh, for simplicity, imagine the responses as just real numbers. But actually, it can basically be any kind of metric space. But it, it doesn't change uh, the intuition in any way. OK, so in a slightly more formal way, so there's an algorithm. The view starts as an empty set or empty sequence. And for k iterations, k will always denote the number of iterations. n will always denote the sample size. So for k iterations, um, the analyst provides a query. The mechanism provides a response based on the sample set. And we add it to the transcript. OK, so it might look a bit weird, but actually when you think about it, most of science, well, database science at least, is, is, is working this way, right? It's, it's either the, the, the human that is doing this, or it's an algorithm that iteratively tries to find something, optimize something, whatever. Um, and, and why does it work? Why, why do we manage to do science this way? Because we have all sorts of concentration bounds that uh, guarantee that with high probability, the sample is representative in some way. So the next natural question will be representative of what? By definition, if you want to be representative of something, we assume there is something true in the world. So the way we usually formalize it is there's an underlying distribution uh, from which the sample set was sampled. Usually we assume it's IID, for, uh, it's, it was sampled IID, but theoretically, again, we can generalize. Um, and now we can define a goal. So this has many uh, versions in many contexts in, in, in learning in the general case, but 
here's one of them. So uh, a mechanism will be called alpha beta distribution accurate if with high probability over both the sampling and the process, the process might be random. The analyst might be random, the mechanism might be random. So if, if with high probability over the whole process, um, all of the responses provided to all of the queries are relatively accurate, where uh, the definition of uh, Q of D, just the notation we'll use a lot, is basically the empirical value of Q of S when S was sampled according to D. So far, okay? Um, again, for simplicity, we will focus on a certain kind of queries, which is called linear queries, where the query is actually defined over a single element, and we're just estimate the, the, the value of the query on the sample set is just the mean, the empirical mean over the sample set. And one of the typical cases is we consider queries where the value is bounded. So um, it's not the, the, the range of response. Again, here I'm implicitly assuming it's a, it's a norm, it's, it's, a, it's, well, it's a metric space, but again, let's imagine R is just a real number, so the bound is very clear what it means. And um, so, so if cha for each element, oh, this went up, it should. Uh, so if each element, the, the range is delta, so basically changing one element to the sample set, I change the value by at most delta over n, which will be important later. Okay, so what can we say? So the chain of Hofding and that whole family of... Uh, of bounds tell us that if we want to be alpha beta distribution accurate for k queries, then n, the sample size, should be uh, of this order of magnitude. You usually, you see it in a different way. You see it alpha as a function of the rest of the parameters or something like that, but because we will be comparing the sample size to the number of queries, fixing alpha and beta uh, along the way, so I wrote it this way, the reason K is there, it's union bound, and the reason there's so much space around it, because as we go along, we'll add more alternatives. Okay, so far so good, seems like science should always work. So what is the problem? The problem is that this guarantee that I just mentioned holds only if the query, the function I am evaluating, was defined before I sampled. First I said I want to estimate the average height of Israelis and then I sampled 500 Israelis. If I chose this query based on the sample set, naturally I can arbitrarily overfit. The most extreme case is the indicator function, right? The indicator function, a function that is one on the set and, and zero outside, um, has an empirical mean of one, right? It's one over all whole sample set and a true distribution mean of practically zero depending on uh, how is the distribution, how, how wide it is in a sense. So you might say, okay, but that's stupid. No one will do that. That's, that's not a good scientist. Well, the indicator function no one will do, but people are choosing their queries based on uh, things they learn from the data. So they sometimes look at, the statisticians usually do, they look at the data just to figure out if there's noise or something that you need to clean, outliers, etc. You do multiple hypothesis testing, um, you do parameter, have your parameters tuning. Um, uh, a lot of learning algorithms are iteratively, uh, we'll have a running example. And one of the extreme cases is even the test set. Uh, there's a famous uh, issue with the leaderboard in Kegel where people are sort of, or might be, it's not so clear if it's an actual phenomena that is uh, common, but in a sense, unintentionally might be overfitting to the um, leader, to, 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 the, to the test set. Okay, all right. So if we, so if we are observing the data, observing the sample, and then issuing the next query, so it seems like the best we can do is actually have the sample size to have a blow up that is linear in the number of queries, meaning for every new query we need a new sample set. Um, that's not good, obviously. So, in a sense, the question is, this is best case. All queries were fixed in advance. This is worst case. Every time I get a response, I look at the sample set, and now I basically have to throw it out. Practically, we're doing something in between. So let's take uh, an example. I, I, I wrote the, the, I think the 
uh, simplest version of gradient descent that we can have. It will be the same if it's going to be stochastic and in all of those versions. It's, I am starting with, uh, with uh, uh, some parameter that I'm trying to tune, and I'm uh, updating it iteratively uh, um, using the gradient. And I'm talking about another theoretical idea of gradient descent where I'm optimizing over some function in the real world. I don't know it. I'm optimizing over this loss function as I estimate it from the data set. I would claim this is exactly the previous mechanism. So the previous interaction. So first, it's not necessarily clear, but if we color it, it becomes a bit more intuitive. So there is the state, which is the theta, and the gradient is the query I'm trying to estimate, and the sample set is the way I use it. So I will break it out, even though it's, it's, it's a bit of a weird way to write it, but just for the idea. So there is the gradient over the, uh, the, the loss function at a given parameter, at a given theta, so that is the function. And now I think of it as I'm issuing this query to the sample set. I'm asking the sample set, well, here is the function I want to estimate, the gradient of the loss function at this parameter, and the sample set provides me an answer, an estimation, and using that I update my state. Fair? Okay. So, Obviously, this is iterative, and I assume all of you know it, that, for instance, if it's a SGD case, so we know that the first epoch, meaning if the first time I use the elements, um, there are many um, uh, generalization guarantees. Once you go beyond one epoch, it becomes more complicated. I'm not saying it's definitely breaking. I mean, for two reasons, I'm not saying it's definitely breaking. First of all, there are other ways to guarantee it. We have, once we have some assumptions on the function, smoothness, liciousness, etc., so we can use that for a guarantee. And we know that in reality, we're doing much better than the theoretical literature will guarantee, but it, it's becoming a challenge. Now, you might say, okay, you know why it doesn't happen? There's no problem usually because the gradient is, is not observing the data. Looking at the gradient is, well, it gives you an answer based on the data, but it doesn't show you the data. So this is just one example out of many. This is just a visual and nice one, so I like to show it, where in 2019 uh, they showed how they managed to construct, to reconstruct the images in the training uh, set from the gradients. So they started with like a general image, and as they go along, they manage to... to uh, um, reconstruct it and it's I, I like it also because you see like this is the area of the image where you didn't learn anything from therefore right the gradient here was zero so therefore you didn't uh, also you have no idea what was the color but basically you see that the gradients leak information it's not a big surprise it's just a visual example so if gradients do allow you to reconstruct the data how do you guarantee that it doesn't happen it probably doesn't happen too much right otherwise how are well, all neural networks are uh, generalizing well. On the other hand, we know it does happen to some extent. That's why the training uh, loss is, is lower than the uh, um, true loss and the test loss. But how do we quantify what's going on here? So formally, um, this is the, the problem statement. If we're not adaptive, the sample size needs, needs to grow logarithmically with the number of iterations, with the number of queries. Uh, if it's fully adaptive, we observe the sample itself. So it needs to grow linearly with the number of queries. And the question is, what happens if I only observe the responses? Right? The, the, the gradient descent algorithm didn't look at the sample set, but it did look at the gradient. So what's going on here? Okay. This is a side comment. So I'm, not, I, I, I'm having a long debate with myself if it's a good idea to show it here or not. Go back to things you know from machine learning. This is very similar to, I think, the, the best, uh, the, the close similarity is the notion from the SSSS, another S paper from 2010, Shai Shai um, um, a replace one stability, those. What, what, what do you say there? You want to make sure that if you had two samples and and um, you change only one element, and so the loss will be very similar. So it's very similar in idea, right? And, it's, and, and the general idea of alpha beta accuracy is basically pack learning. There's one important difference where this is more generalized than the learning setting, and therefore also the requirements are a bit stronger, and that is 
that here we want all responses to be accurate. So again, going back to the gradient descent, if for some reason one of the gradients had a very bad estimation, the sample set really was far off in the estimation of this particular gradient. But after a few more steps, I converge to a correct place, somewhere that's close to the true minima, I don't care. So in PEC learning in general, I care about the final hypothesis, query, response, whatever it is. And therefore, also the definition uh, is relevant only to it. Here in adaptive data analysis, we care about all of them. And intuitively, you can think about it as the difference between the, the training and the validation uh, set. So imagine I'm, I'm, I'm a, um, a, a, a human that is, well, I'm a human, so you don't need to imagine it. Um, so if a human is, um, is using two sets to train uh, uh, some neural network. So the training set, it's an automatic process. You put in a in network architecture or whatever in a sample set and it, it runs the training. And then you observe the response and you're like, wait, the loss is too big. Oh, I know, I needed to add another layer to the architecture. I needed to change it. I needed to have it uh, wider, this layer. I needed to tune my, my learning rate, whatever. So here you're you're using the validation set again and again, and you want all of the answers to be correct, because if one of them is incorrect, it might lead you to an incorrect direction, and then you'll continue working on your uh, architecture, whatever, based on some assumption that changing the, the learning rate in this way was a good or bad idea, and actually, so, in a sense that if there's an automatic process, I want only the final result to be correct. If it's a human in the loop, I usually want the whole list of answers to be correct. But again, it's like an intuitive perspective. It's not a formal claim. Okay, so the big word. So here is the general idea behind the way we want to be able to somehow find the middle ground between the worst case of observing the sample and the best case of, uh, of having it non-adaptive. Let's say the responses will not be exactly the empirical mean which on the, on the first glance seems like a bad idea, but when you think about it, you realize if, it's, if the answer is sufficiently close to the empirical mean, you probably provided valuable information on the true distribution based on the sample set. If you had it sufficiently different from the sample set, you didn't leak too much information about the sample set. So maybe you're able to provide answers that on one hand give the analyst enough information to learn about the world, but not enough information to learn about the sample set. If we can do that, we're in a good world. So now we're uh, proposing uh, another distribution in a sense. The response that is provided is a distribution based on the mechanism, not a deterministic thing. Um, and as a result, we can define a new kind of um, uh, accuracy definition. Now there is sample accuracy. How far is the response from the empirical mean? Till now, it didn't make sense. The response was supposed to be the empirical mean. But now we're considering a case where um, you got the question, what is the uh, rate of, of, I don't know, of, of patients with cancer among the, the smokers in this uh, sample set? And the correct answer is, I don't know, 15%? And you say 60, maybe. Or you, it's a, your response is a distribution around 50. Ugh. And the third thing that we, we want to consider, okay, now how close is the empirical mean to the true mean? And that's what we sometimes call generalization gap in the context of learning. So the intuition is basically we will try to do some uh, triangle inequality. A wants to know Q of D, the empirical, the, the true mean over the distribution. Um, what M tells A are the responses. From, from, the, from the sample set and the query. And M knows the uh, empirical mean. So if the empirical mean is very close to the response, so a lot of information is leaking, so this quantity might start to grow because the queries might start to overfit to the sample set and this guarantee that Q of S is close to Q of D will deteriorate. On the other hand, if they're very far, imagine the um, mechanism provides a constant number or a completely random number. 
So it definitely didn't leak any information about the sample set, but it also didn't provide any useful information. So this quantity was big. If we manage to balance it and both of these are bounded, so a triangle inequality will provide us a distribution accuracy. This is a general idea. And the only question is, is it possible? Um, spoiler alert, it is possible and it was done and I'll show it in a moment. But before I'll show how it was done, I want to propose a slightly different perspective that will explain why is this happening. So let's think about the following distribution. I am the analyst or someone observing the interaction from the side of it, and I'm asking myself, what is the probability over the sample set that this is the sample set that is in the belly of the mechanism? Right? I didn't see the, the, the sample set that the mechanism got. And I'm asking myself, what is the sample set that the mechanism is holding? So at the beginning, before the interaction started, I don't know anything. So all I have is the prior uh, underlying distribution. Whatever is the distribution that the mechanism sampled from. Now, I have two relevant uh, distributions. There's the probability of the response given the sample set. That's, that's the, the internal randomness of the mechanism, right? If the mechanism, if, if the true um, percentage of patients with this condition is 15%, what is the probability to get any number between 0 and 100? And, and we can always define the marginal distribution over the responses, which is just, okay, combining these two, assuming I know it, it's theoretical, it's not a practical, I'm not going to propose a mechanism, I'm proposing only an analysis. Uh, I can always define a marginal distribution over responses, and why am I doing it? Because now I can define this thing, this quantity. The, the probability of S given R is just the ratio, um, base uh, law, and what it means is this is a posterior distribution that the analyst or anyone observing from the side has over the sample sets where this means that this is the probability that this is the sample set that the mechanism is holding given the fact that this is the response he got, right? It slightly changed my distribution because there was an underlying distribution, but now I got this number which is slightly far from, from the average, so it raises the probability that this is the sample set and lowers that one. And of course, I, I wrote it for a single response. It, it holds for a whole interaction. So I, I saw the view of a long interaction of size k, and now my distribution might have shifted quite significantly or barely changed. <clears throat> so now we will have another notation. The query evaluated on, on D superscript V is essentially um, the, the query evaluated in the posterior distribution. So now we have this requirement. A mechanism will be posterior accurate if, what are we asking here? That the responses, they won't be close to the true mean, but to the posterior mean. Right? They will match what an external observer sees. And similarly, we can define a different version of generalization, base table, and here's where the Bayesian comes from, that is how much did the posterior differ, does the posterior differ from the prior, not in the general case of a divergence between distributions, we'll consider it in a moment, but um, as, as how much is the, the mean of this particular query uh, different. So in a sense, we can replace this original triangle with a new one. The change is here. Before, it was what M knows. M, the mechanism, knows the query over the sample set. But what A knows along the interaction, it can know, it might not know the underlying distribution, but at most it can know the posterior distribution and as a result the posterior mean. So again, we can hope for a triangle inequality. So what does it mean? If the responses match what I expected from the posterior distribution, and the posterior distribution in some sense is not too far from the prior distribution, at least with respect to this uh, query, then I would be able to guarantee um, distribution accuracy. Um, 
One second. Uh, so before questions, is it perfectly uh, clear or perfectly unclear at this point? I'll hope with the perfectly clear. Okay. Um, so, so basically we had two tasks here, right? This one and this one. So sample accuracy, sorry. Sample accuracy was easy, right? I'm the mechanism. I control the responses. I know the sample set. It's easy. I will just provide the correct answer. Or I would randomly sample in, uh, a response that is not too far, so I can control it. What do I do with posterior accuracy? So, first theorem. If you're alpha, beta, sample accurate, you're sort of alpha, beta, posterior accurate. There's, the O is, is mainly hiding ugly terms, not uh, big terms. Um, and why? So the intuitive idea is basically I'm changing the order of summation. What is sample accuracy? Is it's a distribution over the response given the sample set. What does the posterior mean? It's the uh, distribution over sample sets given the responses. So what happens is that when you write it, it's basically changing from running over the sample sets and then running over the responses given the sample sets to running over the views and then running over the sample sets given the uh, view. So there's nothing really interesting there. Okay, so the second direction is the interesting direction. So here's a lemma that is, once you see the proof, it's practically trivial, but it, it tells a story. And the lemma says the following thing. The query evaluated over the posterior distribution and the query evaluated over the prior distribution, the difference between them is exactly, not bounded by, but, by, by, but exactly, the covariance between the query and the base factor, where the base factor, k, is the ratio between the probability of the sample set given the view and the sample set, the prior and posterior, or same goes for the view, right? It's the prior and posterior over the views, the prior and posterior over the sample sets, and this is exactly identical. So I'll first show the proof because it's so short. So what is the query evaluated over the posterior distribution. It's the expectation where S is sampled according to the posterior distribution of Q of S, which is identical to sampling S according to the prior distribution, multiplying by this ratio and fixing it. So that's basically it, and it, it, it's because this is the, the expectation in this term is one. That's that. Um, so, Basically what it tells us is that how much does the query, how much is the value of the query change as the distributions change? It's basically an effect of two things. One is how much is k, right? If the base factor is very small, meaning the distribution didn't change by much, so no query can overfit. But even if, a, if, if the distribution changed, changed significantly, still the query might not leverage it. So um, going back to our gradient descent example, a small k would mean that even looking at the whole list of gradients or the con current state of the, of, the, of the parameters of the network doesn't tell me much about the sample sets. Most sample sets would have provided the same one. A high base factor and a small correlation means the whole data set is already encoded in, in, in the weights somehow. But the next query just doesn't leverage it. Right? So when I'm issuing the loss function, for instance, is not strongly correlated with this piece of information. Okay, so main takeaway so far, sample accuracy is easy to control. Sample accuracy implies posterior accuracy, so posterior accuracy is easy to control. Posterior accuracy combined with base stability implies distribution accuracy, that's the triangle inequality we saw. And base stability is effectively the co correlation between the query and the base factor. So this is the only thing that's left to take care of. Um, side note. From now on, we will discuss, we'll consider only tools to bound the base factor. 
meaning we will provide guarantees regardless of, for, for any, for worst case queries. Even the query that will be as, at most correlated won't be able to do much harm because the base factor is bounded. Okay, so how do we do it? So the original known direction was differential privacy. This whole direction is relatively early. The notion of differential privacy was proposed in 2006 and the usage uh, for uh, protecting against overfitting only in around 2015. Um, some of you are probably more familiar and some are less familiar with differential privacy, so I won't get into the privacy aspect of it. I'll just provide the formal definition and the intuition to why is it relevant. So formally, a uh, mechanism will be called epsilon delta differentially private. If for any two neighboring data sets, uh, uh, neighboring meaning that they differ only by one element, the probability induced over the responses um, given sample set one or given sample set two are very close in a specific, a specific divergence metric. This is called max divergence or delta approximation max divergence. Intuitively, you can think of it and it's correct up to some blowout in the factors as having a high probability guarantee, high probability um, of one minus delta, that the ratio between the probability to, to, to see a response given S and S prime is very close, epsilon close. Formally, the log of the ratio is bounded by epsilon. Uh, and, and you can already see why it's going to be interesting because if I take expectation over one of them, let's say S or S prime, so it's basically the probability to see the response given S versus the probability to see the response in general. This is the base factor. This is how it's going to be used. And why is it uh, um, a useful tool? Because differential privacy has two key properties that are essential here in the context of uh, adaptive data analysis. The first is that it holds under post-processing, meaning that it doesn't matter what external information you use to, and combine with the response, you cannot degrade the, the result. So here, here it, it uh, gets us back to, um, to uh, learning. So in the uh, replace one stability notion, the definition is that the loss function has a very similar value if you're changing one element. Okay. But what happens if I look at the response and do some post-processing and try to extract information from it, then I don't have any guarantee. It might mean that the distributions are very far from each other, the distributions given to uh, different sample sets, but the loss function doesn't leverage it. So if it's a learning algorithm and there's a loss function at the end and that's that, no one is going to do anything afterwards, good enough. If it's a post-processing situation and any kind of situation where a human is in the loop, there is a post-processing, he observes the answer, and then he thinks. That's the problem, we think. You look at it, and you reach a conclusion. And who knows what the conclusion will be? That's a post-processing. The amazing thing here is that it holds under post-processing. Why does it hold under post-processing? Because this is a distance, this is a bound of the distance measure between the distributions. It's not saying anything about the kind of query you, you issued the distributions themselves are close. And if they're close, no post-processing. It's the, basically the information theoretic um, inequality. Is the query is linear and post-processing can be like not linear. Or... So I'm running with the linear case all along and I'm running with the IID all along. Um, linear is not necessarily. What we need is um, uh, low sensitivity queries, meaning that if you issue the query on two sample sets that differ by only one element, it doesn't change by more than something. That's sufficient from the uh, differential privacy perspective. The IID is essential from, uh, for um, uh, differential privacy. That's one of the gains that we will uh, see with this new approach. But what were you asking? Does the function, it does the post-processing? Are there any assumptions on that? Yeah. No, 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 oh, no. But, but when we will want to have uh, generalization guarantees using differential privacy, then it will need to be linear so it will work. But differential privacy as a privacy notion in the general uh, theorem of post-processing doesn't uh, assume anything. Right. Uh, the second thing, and the one that's interesting, is 
that it, it composes gracefully. Meaning, even if there is an adaptive process, where the next query is issued based on the previous responses, um, the, the epsilon delta parameters, which naturally grow at some rate, don't grow too fast. And what's not too fast? The epsilon of the whole interaction is order of magnitude of square root of k times epsilon. And the third thing is that epsilon delta differential privacy implies about epsilon delta based stability. Uh, intuitively speaking, if differential privacy bounds the ratio between the, pro the prior and posterior, you already understand how it can bound the k, the, the base factor, and as a result, um, guarantee base stability. Okay, so, so, so far I convinced you, hopefully, that if I'm differentially private and sample accurate, which implies posterior accurate, um, I will be able to guarantee generalization and distribution accuracy. But who said it's possible? Right? I said we need to balance between the two, um, the two, the two um, uh, things I want to achieve. One is not to be too far, and one not to be too close. So here's one particular example. This is by no means the only differentially private mechanism, but this is just one very intuitive one. I add noise that scales like some parameter theta, uh, eta. Right? So I have a noise with a variance eta squared, and that's what I add to the response. Instead of providing the correct response, I add some noise. And we have a bound that for any beta, I am uh, eta times the square root of log blah. If, if you're not familiar, don't bother. You just need to have the formal defi definition. What matters is that actually, it's something you saw in many cases. You're familiar with the idea of a adding noise to the gradient. Why do you add noise to the gradient? There are many stories about why is it a good idea. And I'm not claiming that this is the only reason to do it or even the correct reason to do it. But one of the advantages you can get from adding noise to the gradient is that you have this masking effect. And what happens is when you tailor the noise correctly, you get this uh, bound from differential privacy, where the sample size grows only like the square root of k. Better than linearly with k, significantly better, still significantly worse than um, the logarithmic um, uh, bound we have in the non-adaptive case. Okay, so... Once we look at it, the natural next question would be, can we do better? So, since the dependencies in alpha and beta are about the same we, as, as the non-adaptive case, we don't expect to do any better. Um, the constants in the last papers that came out are, are very small, are about the same order of magnitude of the, of the constants in the non-adaptive case, so maybe there's very little uh, to do there, but not much. Um, in the square root k, there's a proof that it's impossible to improve. What do I mean by it? That there is an analyst uh, that is able to sort of break the generalization guarantee within n squared iterations. So it means that if you want to guarantee... K squared. No, n, so if k is n squared, or n is the square root of k, it will be able to break it. Um, how would it do it? Essentially, it will issue very smart queries such that it puts the, the, the mechanism in a dilemma where you're either giving up sample accuracy and then it's just nonsense, or you, you're providing too much information. At some point, you just can run out of it. So if you want to protect against the worst case analyst, which is a strong requirement, and maybe we can do better than that, but if you want to protect against the worst case analyst, you can't do better than square root of k. So, one might think it's done, and um, this was a nice lecture, but there's no paper. So here comes the trick. I said before I add noise that scales like theta squared, like eta squared, but 
There's something I sort of swept under the rug. What is the scale of the noise? A problem needs a natural scale. I can always multiply the query by 10 or divide it by 100. If I need to define what is the uh, scale of, of this whole language in which uh, um, um, alpha is measured even. What does it mean to be alpha beta accurate? What is alpha? What are the units? In sense? So the natural um, scale that people tend to use is the range of the queries. And usually when you do um, this kind of, uh, of noise addition, you also use clipping. So you define some maximal value of the uh, gradient that you consider, where let's say you have a prior knowledge of what is the reasonable uh, range of uh, values. And that's the range I mentioned before, the maximum min minus the minimum. And, uh, and my noise scales with that range. So actually, what I wrote before was incorrect. It was not one here. It was delta squared. Right? The alpha scaled with delta. Now, in the non-adaptive case, we actually have better results. It's basically the Bernstein family of uh, bounds which says that you, your um, accuracy scales with the standard deviation. Or if it's a Gaussian, so with the variance proxy. And it makes sense, because if I have a distribution that is generally concentrated between 0 and 1, and there's a negligible probability that it will be a million. It shouldn't matter, almost shouldn't matter. Um, so you basically have two terms. Uh, the second term is in the case of a range, if it's uh, if, if you have a sub-Gaussian uh, guarantee, so you replace, so you repl this sigma doesn't mean the variance, but the variance proxy of the sub-Gaussian, and then you don't need the other term, but we'll stick with IID in a bounded range. And because here it's alpha and not alpha squared, and alpha is small relative to the range and the variance, that's, the, 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 that's my goal. So usually the second um, term is, is negligible relative to the first one, otherwise it's basically a heavy tail solution. So the natural question is, can we do the same with the adaptive case using the, the differential privacy or the differential privacy flavor toolkit? And the answer is not so much. Because differential privacy is worst case in nature. I'm not saying it as a negative about, about privacy, because reminding you, differential privacy, as the name suggests, was not created for generalization purposes. It was created for privacy. And privacy, you want it to be worst case. You want to guarantee someone privacy uh, against any kind of queries and in basically any situation. You want to guarantee it to anyone, right? Not only an average person, even if you're very fat or tall or short or rich or poor or whatever, or from a minority, you, want, you still want privacy. So going back, the Gaussian mechanism I showed you had this guarantee. This is the term we should look at. So we're comparing two neighboring data sets, and the amount of information, not using it formally, that leaked was proportional in the way to the difference in the query value. So how did we uh, provide epsilon delta guarantee? So we took the maximum over two neighboring data sets, and we said it's bounded by capital delta over n because the query is delta bounded and it's, um, it's a linear query. That's how we used it. Again, this is not, going back to your question, it's not something that's generally in differential privacy. It's if you use differential privacy for linear queries, for bounded linear queries. This is worst case in basically any aspect you can think of. It's worst case over the queries. It's worst case over the, uh, sam the, 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 the elements that I swap, the rest of the sample set, the way I will uh, choose the, the, the queries, the, the underlying distribution, everything. So obviously the bounds will be proportional to the range and not to the variance because the, ver the, the distribution doesn't play a role here. So if we want to move from range to variance, we need to use a different perspective. And this is where pairwise concentration comes in. So what is pairwise concentration? Um, so given a function that receives two sample sets and a uh, sequence of queries and provides a number, which we should think of as some kind of local sensitivity function, a function that tells you that with respect to this sequence of queries, 
how much do these two sample sets look different from each other? And we can define a, a function uh, of the sample set and a view where the, I'm taking expectation over the second sample set, right? You can already guess why I'm doing it. It's the same as we did with the, with the base factor, right? The, the, the probability of V is expectation over S, probability of V given S. And this notation is just the sequence of the queries that is in, that is part of the, of the view. So a mechanism will be called C pairwise concentrated. If for any lambda greater than one, this monster happens. Now, it's, it's a bit of a mouse, mouthful. So uh, I'll start by reminding people, whoever know, is familiar with Rene, Diver Rene Divergence will find it a bit more intuitive. And if not, I'll try to explain what's happening here. So effectively, this is a slightly weird way to say that uh, we bounded the Rene Divergence uh, of the distribution of this log term by this term, which is on itself a random variable, which is a bit weird, and we took expectation over everything. So, but, but let's ignore running divergence and think about it on its own. So I have this ratio, this is the base factor, and I took its log, and ignoring the weird phenomena where it's lambda minus one instead of lambda, which is an artifact of the way Rene divergence is written, this is basically lambda times this random variable minus lambda squared times this. So this is a sub-Gaussian bound on the, uh, this log term, which is uh, called the information density in the case of information theory or the uh, privacy loss uh, random variable in the case of uh, privacy. And basically saying this function controls Sorry, controls, in a sense, the, the, the random variable which tells us how much information leaked about the sample set by viewing this uh, view. And I'm taking expectation over everything, right? So I don't care about worst case sample set, worst case view. I'm taking expectation over everything. And in a sense, it's saying that if you want to know how concentrated is this distribution, how much information typically um, leaks, this is the function that tells you the story. And what's nice is that we have the same properties. It holds under post-processing. That's not surprising because basically any kind of bound that is about, uh, a bound on the distribution and not on the particular query will hold on the post-processing. It has adaptive composition linearly. It's basically sort of a martingale when you look at it. Nothing is very surprising here. And the nice thing is that it implies uh, base stability with this term that is a bit confusing, but when you look at it, what happens is I'm taking expectation, again, over S and V, of E to this term. And, and I can choose any lambda I want. Lambda here is basically log one over delta. That's give or take what's happening. Oh, see, it should have been, uh, I forgot to change it. It's, it's, uh, it's for any delta greater than zero. What changed between the two definitions? So essentially there are two differences. One is the distance measure is changed. Instead of uh, saying where epsilon delta uh, differential privacy is as saying epsilon delta max divergence, so delta approximation max divergence, um, we switch to Rini divergence. This is not a new idea. In differential privacy, it's also sometimes used. It's called zero concentration DP proposed in 2016, I think, by uh, Thomas Steinke and Mark Boone. And um, at the intuitive level, it's a generalization because usually what happens if when you say it's epsilon delta, so for any epsilon, you have a delta. For any delta, you have an epsilon. And if you want to say something about the relation between the two, this is a, a way to quantify what's the relation between the epsilon and delta. The interesting thing here, the new thing is the locality. Instead of having some quantity, right? This, no? If here we had a constant, some number, that will be the equivalence of, uh, of providing uh, ZCDP, zero concentration differential privacy, meaning for any two sample sets, for any interaction, I can bound the, the Rene divergence between the two distributions. But 
it's still for worst case, and then when we use it, we will still have the delta. The new thing is introducing locality, which, by the way, can be introduced to the classical version of differential privacy. Only thing is the um, Renidi version is, is, more, is a stronger on the technical level, on the mathematical level. So we chose that. And now it's not worst case, it's tailored to the specific sample set and the specific view. And when you take the expectation over it, you can do better. As a result, we have three key advantages. First one is the scale in our problem comes from the variance, not from the range. And as a result, as you'll see, uh, we reach uh, the bound that goes with the variance. Second is that now we have no problem dealing with uh, unbounded queries. Differential privacy also has guarantees for unbounded queries, but the way they use it is, is, a, a, are, are, is by introducing very involved mechanisms which uh, uh, look at the sample set and do concatenation and all sorts of things and combine median and mean. And it's uh, it's uh, not so natural, and you pay a lot in the constants. Here, it's, it's just you, you run the same analysis on the same mechanism, and you're good. And you don't need IID. What you need, you, you can deal with the arbitrary distribution, right? because if it's strongly correlated, then effectively your sample size is one. But all you need is that sort of a Martingale or Malkov-like property where the distribution over the, um, the rest of the sample set after I fix some prefix is still has the same bounded or, or uh, sub-Gaussian uh, property. Um, and in our case, it will basically be adding noise, but that noise uh, scales like the variance of the gradients instead of its uh, range. The variance of the gradient means if you take the gradient as a function and you uh, run it over all the sample sets, had you known the distribution, it has a variance. And the variance in the case of a, of a vector is basically the variance of the norm. But, um, and and, and uh, this suffices to get the bound that we wanted. So now, in a sense, the picture is, is completed. We have the same uh, square root bound as the case of, uh, of uh, D DP. And we have the dependence and the variance instead of the range, as in uh, Berenstein. And we pay just very little worse than in the constants. It's practically the same. So once the variance is like a factor of two, four, we didn't work the numbers exactly, but it's somewhere there, you're already in an advantage. Um, OK. So there's still several directions in which we can continue to improve this thing. Because you know, I said that uh, the, the dependence on k was optimal, and now even the range is optimal. So where is there still place for improvement? So one place is, what do you do if the variance is unknown? Right? Um, so it's, it's not a big complaint against us, because everyone somehow assumes that a range is known. But it's different, because a range is known because you can force it. You just clip. And the variance you sort of can't force. Um, so a natural direction would be to add noise that scales like the empirical variance. Just look at the variance of the query on your sample set and add noise. And that's one of the next steps results that there is a mechanism. It was proposed by Vitali Feldman and Thomas Yeah, right. I think so. Um, but they proved only that it provides generalization and expectation. And we think uh, using our tools, we can uh, prove that it provides generalization with high probability. Um, and the biggest question is, what can we do? We're still worst case over the analyst. We get rid of most of the worst caseness, not the worst caseness over the analyst. So what does it mean to be non-worst case in the analyst? And you can look at it in two perspectives. One is to say the analyst can do whatever it wants, but we can identify or guarantee that the query will not be highly correlated with the base factor. Remember at the beginning I said that the, 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 base, uh, the, the base stability is effectively controlling the correlation between the query and the base factor. So here we did our best to bound the base factor, but maybe even if you didn't bound it, you can either guarantee or observe that the query is not highly correlated with it. 
And a different def direction is to say, I don't say anything about the query, I say something about the analyst. We know the, the um, analyst is not trying to do the worst. The analyst is trying to learn, right? The, the, we're, we're not playing a game against each other. The, the mechanism and the analyst are on the same side. So analysts, nat usually the natural analysts, the ones in the real world, are probably doing things that are much less har harmful. But the question is, how do you formalize it? So again, if it's a human, what can you do? You, you, you don't know what's happening in your head when you're trying to learn if you are actually tailoring your queries to the sample set or to the distribution. But if you are uh, considering a mechanism, you might be able to say, I see that this analyst has limited memory or limited computation or limited knowledge or, or a certain type of behavior and things like that. Maybe you can do better. There's one paper that is called Natural Analysts that is achieving some improvements, assuming some bounds in the analyst, but if I might say, they're not as natural as they claim in the title. So, uh, but, but, but this is definitely the place where, mo because this is what happens actually in reality probably, right? There is a learning algorithm and the gradient estimation is running for much longer than we can guarantee anything, not using adaptive data analysis tools, neither using any other uh, system. And we know that it somehow doesn't um, overfit, usually. Why? Because it's not trying to do it in some way. Why? Because something in the way know, networks are built or gradient descent is happening or the distributions that, right, we're not worst case over distributions. We have a specific type of distribution in our world and maybe distribution over cats and dogs is nicer than the distribution that we can come up with for a counterexample. So something about this is probably what explains why things work better in the real world and now we need to figure out how can we quantify it. Thank you. Question? Perfectly clear or perfectly yeah, unclear? That's a good question. Um, so, let me rephrase the question and tell me if, if it fits what you're asking. Is the only way to guarantee distribution accuracy going through sample accuracy? Right? That, that's in a way because all the directions I, I showed are I'll use my sample to provide response and then I will um, um, try to somehow balance to tell enough but not too much. Say, well, maybe I can do it in a completely different direction. So, the lower bound papers have, okay, sorry. I didn't see a theorem that states the following thing. A mechanism can't be distribution accurate without being sample accurate. But the spirit of the lower bounds feels like this kind of theorem might be correct. And the idea is, assuming you don't have external information, right? If you know the distribution, for instance, obviously you, can, you don't need any kind of sample accuracy. But if all you know is the sample, the analyst can come up with a certain type of queries where you cannot do anything about the distribution, you cannot guess anything about the correct value of the query besides what you know on your sample. It comes from cryptography type of, of claim. So if this is the case, it's probably, and it's one of the things that I, 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 I'm interested in, and can we prove it formally and just get rid of this question? Because indeed, it's a good question. Maybe there's a completely different direction to go with. Thank you.